Thank you, Jim. I will, uh, I will sign books afterwards. What Jim didn't tell you is you also have the opportunity to own a rare unsigned copy, <laughs> if you so choose. I've been, uh, uh, I, I'm, now, I'm now working at Hillsdale College. I moved here this summer, uh, grew up in Michigan, but I was in Washington, D.C. for almost 20 years as a, as a professional writer. I came back to, to uh, uh, eagerly came back to my home state of Michigan to, to run the journalism program there at Hillsdale. And my wife and I took our kids to a Michigan game, went to the Ohio State game this year. It was the first time we, we were, were alumni. It was our first time back at a football game with, with, with one exception right after we graduated, our first time back in Ann Arbor for a football game. And the, um, um, everybody had to have a jersey, right? Uh, my kids had been saving up some money. They wanted to go buy a jersey, and my wife wanted to get a jersey. And so we went to the game, and, and you know, they, all, they, went, they marched into the store. This was a very expensive day for, 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 for me. And marched into the store, and they all got the same jersey, right? I mean, what number did they get? 16, right, for Denard. You know, exciting player. I totally get that. Um, I didn't get a jersey because I already had one. And mine was number 48. Who's number 48? Gerald Ford. <laughs> Gerald Ford wore number 48 for University of Michigan. They have retired only, I think, four or five numbers at Michigan. They haven't retired Desmond Howard's number. They haven't retired Charles Woodson's number. Uh, none of those guys, but they did retire number 48. No one will ever wear that again. So I, I wear number 48. I think you can, with, with these Michigan jerseys, you can probably tell something about the person based on what number they pick. You know, 16, they're excited about the team right now. They like dreadlocks and shoelaces and exciting plays and all that. Um, I'm not sure what, what 48 tells us. It is probably a, a, an expression of my inner geek that I that I that I know this and that that's my that's my number, but I'm uh, I'm number 48 when I put on my Michigan jersey. Uh, Jim also mentioned um, um, the controversy over over concussions in, in football. Who watched the Super Bowl? Yeah, I know y'all watched the Super Bowl, right? Um, did you see the commercial? I don't know if it was at halftime. It might have been between the third and the fourth quarter, but it was the NFL commercial. It was probably about a minute long. And, and the takeaway point was is the NFL really cares about safety. You remember that one? And, and it, went, it went on for, I think it went on for about a minute. I don't know how much money they left on the table, you know, not selling that space to Budweiser or whatever. But they really wanted to get the message across that the NFL cares about safety. And, and there is this controversy about concussions and the long-term health effects of head injuries. Uh, it's in, 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 our, in our debates right now. But the problem violence has, the problem football has with violence right now is nothing compared to what it was a little more than a century ago. So let me start by sharing a statistic with you. In 1905, 18 people died playing football. In 1905, 18 people died playing football. That's what they were dealing with back then. Let's go back in time and look at that era. If I go a little bit further back in time to when Teddy Roosevelt was a young man. On November 18th, 1876, Roosevelt watched his first football game. He was an 18-year-old freshman at Harvard. He got on a train with a bunch of his friends. They went down to New Haven, and they watched the second ever football game played between Harvard and Yale, these great rivals. Remember, what is the Ivy League? The Ivy League is an athletic conference. It's not an academic club, but it's, not, it's an athletic conference. Well, Harvard and Yale are, are, are great rivals then and now. Um, Alabama has Auburn, Army has Navy, Michigan has Ohio State. Um, I hate to say it, but, but Grand Valley State is the team Hillsdale most wants to beat every year. Uh, <laughs> when they play. I've asked this of a number of athletes and they regard Grand Valley State as their top mark every year. Well, Harvard and Yale have each other. And on that day in 1876, they played football only for the second time. 
the weather was lousy, the skies were overcast, the wind was blowing in from the sea. It was so bad ships couldn't leave the harbor that day uh, with these cold blasts of air. As Roosevelt shivered, he watched a game that was quite different from the sport we know now. There were no quarterbacks, there were no wide receivers, there were no first downs, there were no forward passes. Football was in its infancy. Before the play began, the captains from the two teams met at midfield and they discussed the rules they would use that day. They were like school kids in a schoolyard discussing where out of bounds would be, uh, how to count blitzes, whether you're gonna play touch or tackle. Uh, they, were, they were really literally making up some of these rules as they went along. That day though, um, um, uh, they, they agreed to a few rules. First of all, Yale decided it would play by this with, with, with the ball that Harvard had sent them a few days earlier. Uh, Yale had been practicing with, with a spherical ball, like a soccer ball. That's what they were used to playing football with. Harvard, at the Harvard team, a few days before the game, sent them a, a new ball shaped like a watermelon and said, this is what we're gonna use. And it confused the Yale players. They said, well, how do you kick that? Do you kick it on the side, on the end? They didn't know. So Harvard got its way with the ball. Yale proposed two rules that, uh, that afternoon. One of them would have a lasting effect. The other would matter only that day. The first rule Yale proposed is that they'd play 11 men to a side. There'd be 11 players on each side. This was the first football game to feature 11 players on each side of the ball. Up until that point, 15 had been the, uh, the, the, the traditional number. That was the first with 11. The other suggestion Yale made that Harvard agreed to uh, would not have a lasting effect on the game, but it would matter that afternoon. Yale proposed that touchdowns would not count for points. Only, only kicks would count for points. So if you scored a touchdown, you had the opportunity to make a kick. It was the extra point. And if you kicked what was basically a field goal from the field, that was worth a point also. So you score one point by point by point, touchdowns wouldn't count, but they'd let you kick. These were the rules they agreed to. So they started playing, and by the way, the ball, to, 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 to score on one of these kicks, the ball had to sail between a pair of poles with a rope tied between them. So in the first half, Harvard, which was heavily favored, scored a touchdown, but they missed the kick. So at halftime, the score was nothing to nothing. And the second half, Yale came out and pushed into Harvard territory. And a lanky freshman named Walter Camp, a name you may have heard before, lanky freshman named Walter Camp had the ball and he made one of these lateral uh, passes, you know, backwards to another player. Well, the ball, this watermelon-shaped ball, took, hit the ground and took one of these funny hops that footballs are prone to do. And it was this disastrous lateral pass. Well. A guy behind him named Oliver Thompson thought he saw an opportunity and he put his foot to the ball. And from a wide angle and 35 yards out, the ball sailed through the uprights on an improbable kick. So it's one nothing Yale. And that's how the game finished. Yale won one to nothing. Harvard's loss frustrated Roosevelt, who was watching it in the cold. In a letter to his mother the next day, he didn't say whether he enjoyed himself as he watched this game for the first time. And the future president had no inkling of the role he would play in this sport's future. But he did give voice to the frustration that so often accompanies the agony of defeat. I am sorry to say we were beaten, he wrote, principally because our opponents played very foul. Now, in a moment, I'll talk more about Teddy Roosevelt and what he did for football. But first, let me say a few words about why football matters, both to me personally and to Americans generally. I met my wife on the way to a football game in Ann Arbor. That's my first clear memory of her, is walking from, from Markley, our dorm, to Michigan Stadium. We didn't start dating until basketball season. But right after, and right after graduation, we got engaged on the Diag. Years, years before we were joined in matrimony, we shared a love for the maize and blue. Now my romance with college football goes back even further. My father went there, made sure I could sing Hail to the Victors as soon as I could talk. 
So I remember in, in my era, the Carter era is a reference not to a troubled presidency in the 1970s, but a time when Anthony Carter wore a winged helmet and scored touch, you know, caught touchdown passes. He was, he was the Denard Robinson of, of, of my boyhood. When I started attending Michigan football games as a student with my future bride and 100,000 of our closest friends, it, it dawned on me that these contests are more than athletic competitions. They're, they're cultural rituals of deep significance. They unite a diverse campus of engineering students and English majors. Uh, they also create a community of fans across the region and, and beyond. Uh, you can be a, a, a fan of the team, can be young or old or black or white or a, a lunch bucket union guy or an auto executive. Um, you know, conversations about the team are social icebreakers. I can't tell you what a large percentage of conversations with my dad involve Michigan football, right? Especially in the autumn. Um, it gives colleagues at work something to talk about around the water cooler. They're, they're icebreakers at social events. And, and my marriage is certainly not the only one that owes a debt to the game. Love for a college football team, whether this is, it's the Texas Longhorns or the Hillsdale Chargers, is almost tribal. In some cases, such as my own, it's practically inherited. In others, it's, it, can be, it can be chosen. But whatever its origin, it has the power to form lifelong passions and loyalties. I still get chills thinking about the team taking the field in Ann Arbor to the fight song, the marching band playing the fight song. The sensation is a close cousin to patriotism. And on brisk autumn afternoons, my main loyalties are to God, family, and Michigan football. And let's face it, objectively speaking, football is an awesome sport. No other game has such a combination of brute force and pure grace. 99-yard touchdown runs and goal line stands. The crashing bodies at the line of scrimmage and the careful choreography of well-executed plays involving 11 men. The infantry assault of a, of, a, of a rushing attack in the air war of a passing game. There's a strong intellectual dimension as well. Baseball has this reputation as the cerebral pastime. But no sport demands more meticulous planning or quick calculation than football. This is a pursuit not just for players and the fans who cheer them on, but coaches and the armchair generals who second guess their every move. So it's a little wonder that football has become the most popular sport in the United States, with thousands of kids who play under Friday night lights, uh, millions who watch games on Saturday afternoons and Sunday afternoons and Sunday nights and Monday nights and all that. I think there were 110 or 11 million people who watched the Super Bowl this year. Americans are more likely to know the name of their favorite team's quarterback than their congressman. And the good case can be made that they have their priorities straight. So football occupies a central place in our lives. Yet there was a moment when football almost was taken away from us, when its very existence was in mortal peril from a collection of progressive era prohibitionists who tried to ban the game. They objected to its violence, and their favorite solution was to smother a newborn sport in its cradle. Had the enemies of football gotten their way, they might have erased one of America's great pastimes from our national culture. It took the remarkable efforts of Theodore Roosevelt, one of the most remarkable men ever to partake in American politics, to thwart them. Modern controversies over football and violence are in the news these days. Congress has held hearings on concussions in the NFL. Two years ago, Time Magazine, during Super Bowl week, printed a cover story that had deflated football on the cover, and inside, the magazine called the sport, quote, too dangerous for its own good. There are about a dozen lawsuits right now against the NFL filed by former players. Then there's that statistic I shared a moment ago. In 1905, a year of momentous importance for the sport, 18 people died playing football. So whatever the problems of today, they're nothing compared to what they were a little more than a century ago. The sad, the sad thing about this statistic, 18 dead in 1905, the sad thing about this statistic is that it was typical. This was kind of an ordinary year for football. Over the course of, a, of, 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 a, of an ordinary season, then a dozen or more people would die playing football. 
uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, a lot, it, many, many more suffered bad injuries, often gruesome injuries. A lot of these casualties were kids in Sandlot games, but a number of them were also players at big time college programs. Players at the University of Georgia, University of Virginia, Union College, Army, Navy, all died playing football. Football is not a contact sport, it's a collision sport. It is always prized size, strength, and power. This was especially true in its early years. Quirks in the rules back in those days compressed the game's action into a small space rather than spread it across a wide field. Big men pushed and shoved their way through and around masses of bodies all afternoon, clashing and grappling for the ball without the benefit of protective gear. They weren't wearing pads or helmets or any of that stuff. The uh, era of the leatherheads lay in the future. During the frequent pileups hidden from view of the referees, players would wrestle for advantage. They would throw elbows at each other, uh, punch each other in the face. The worst players would try and gouge each other's eyes out of sight from the referees. Bruises, sprains, and other minor injuries were taken for granted. More serious impairments, such as cracked bones and knocked heads, were causes of greater concern, but generally accepted as the unfortunate byproducts of a demanding and entertaining sport. The deaths, of course, were the worst. They were not freak accidents as much as the inevitable toll of an activity that encouraged strong men to crash into each other over and over again across an afternoon. An ordinary tackle can become a life-threatening calamity when the hard-thrusting knee of a ball carrier strikes the head of a, of a defenseman who's trying to tackle him. This slaughter horrified a group of activists who crusaded against football. They wanted not merely to remove violence from the sport, but to ban the sport altogether. At the dawn of the progressive era, the prohibition of football became a social and political phenomenon whose most outspoken proponents included the renowned Harvard president Charles W. Eliot, frontier scholar and University of Wisconsin professor Frederick Jackson Turner, muckraking journalists, and even the aging Confederate General John Mosby. The New York Evening Post attacked the sport. So did The Nation, an influential magazine of, of news and opinion then and now. The Nation worried that colleges were becoming, quote, huge training grounds for young gladiators, around whom as many spectators roar as roared in the Roman amphitheater. The New York Times bemoaned football's trend toward, quote, mayhem and homicide. Two weeks after printing these words, mayhem and homicide, the Times ran a new editorial. The headline was, Two Curable Evils. The first evil it addressed was the lynching of blacks. The second evil was football. The main figure in this movement to ban football was Charles W. Eliot, the president of Harvard. He was probably the single most important figure in the history of higher education in the United States. When we think of Harvard as the great American University, it's because of this guy. He was president of Harvard for 40 years. Nobody before or since has come close. He's the guy who created elective courses, which you now see all over higher education. He got rid of compulsory worship. He, he started professional schools. He, uh, uh, he, 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 he was a great innovator, most important influential person in American higher education history. He's the reason Harvard is considered the, the number one school in America by so many people. He also hated team sports. What bothered him most was competition and how it motivated players to conduct themselves in ways he considered unbecoming of gentlemen. If baseball and football were honorable pastimes, he reasoned, then why do they need umpires and referees? A game that needs to be watched is not fit for genuine sportsmen, he once said. Elliot thought a pitcher who threw a curveball engaged in an act of deception, an act of treachery. Football distressed him even more. Elliot believed it was improper for a running back to attack the weakest part of an opponent's line. The honorable thing to do was to attack the strongest point. He liked almost nothing about football. Most of all, he despised its violence. And time and again, he described the game as evil. And it's not that Elliot hated all sports, because he did like some sports. Um, 
Who knows? What is Harvard's color? Crimson, famously, right? Does anybody know how it got that? How it got the, how, how that affiliation began? From, no, not blood. From from crew. And when Elliot was a student, he was a student at Harvard before he became a press professor and then a president there. He rode for the crew team, and they were having a what? What are they? Regatta, right? You know, a crew race, whatever they call them. Um, they're having a regatta out on the out on the river. There were a number of teams, and Harvard had its had its crew team there. And the question came up: Well, how are we gonna how are we gonna differentiate the teams from the shore? And so, um, you know, the Harvard team wanted to be identified. And Elliot was on this team, and and he sent a teammate up to a store, and said, "Go get some scarves." And the guy came back with with six crimson head scarves, and they they put them on their heads for this competition. And I think they won that race. And from then on, Harvard was associated with the color crimson. And the joke, which Elliot told for the rest of his life, he says, the guy could have come back with blue scarves just as easily. You know, we didn't tell him a color. He just came back with crimson. We put him on, and the rest is history. That's Harvard's color. So anyway, uh, Elliot, Elliot didn't hate sports, but he didn't like team sports. Um, crew, I guess, is a team sport, but he was more into, into you know, hiking and cycling and, and, and those types of activities. Anyway, Elliot hates football. He calls it evil. One of his main adversaries in this, uh, in this fight over football was Walter Camp, the guy who played in that game Teddy Roosevelt watched in 1876. Walter Camp was a pretty good football player, but he's remembered today primarily as a coach and a rules maker. If football has a founding father, it's Walter Camp. He's the closest thing there is to a founding father. He invented the position of quarterback. The way the game was scored, the way we score it now is how Camp wanted it scored. Uh, uh, the, the concept of possessions and downs and the line of scrimmage and uh, formations. On virtually every aspect of the game, in the 1880s and 1890s, Walter Camp left his imprint. He was also a great salesman of the sport who wrote books and newspaper articles promoting the game and making it popular. He and a journalist collaborated on the concept of the all-American team, uh, a term that's familiar to us now. Uh, for Camp and its collaborator, they were under deadline pressure. They had a newspaper column the next day. They didn't know what they were going to write about. And one of them said, well, let's make an all-American team. So they drew it up, and it wound up being wonderful for the sport because it created controversy. It gave people something to argue about, to talk about when the games weren't being played. In the rivalry between Elliot and Camp, we see one of the ongoing conflicts in American politics on display. A fight between the progressives and their dreams of a world without risk and resistance to this agenda. Elliot and the progressives identified a genuine problem with football, but their preferred solution was radical. They wanted to regulate football out of existence because they believed that its participants were not capable of making their own judgments about the costs and benefits of the game. Instead, elites would relieve players of the burden of choosing to play or not to play. They would take away the freedom to play and ban the sport for the sake of its players. Into this struggle stepped Theodore Roosevelt, this remarkable man. Now, as a boy, Roosevelt grew up with a horrible handicap. He had chronic asthma. Relatives were worried that he would not survive childhood. This in a day when it was not uncommon for, for children to, to die young. His parents tried everything to improve his health. They were so desperate, they even resulted to quack cures. At one point, they had, they had young Theodore smoking cigars because they thought it helped clear up his lungs. They, they were literally, they, they, they were trying everything to help the kid. Eventually, his folks concluded that Teddy simply would have to overcome. And there's a story in Roosevelt family lore where the father, Theodore Roosevelt Sr., summons the boy to his uh, study in their Manhattan home. Theodore, he said, you have the mind, but you have not the body. And without the help of the body, the mind cannot go as far as it should. You must make your body. And upon hearing this, the story goes, Teddy threw back his head and flashed his toothy grin and said, then I'll make my body. He was 11 years old at the time. He did begin to make his body. He began 
uh, exercising regularly at a gym. Later on, he took boxing lessons. He hunted. He really did make his body. The asthma would stay with him for years. But eventually, he kind of, it never, it never went away entirely. But eventually, he more or less outgrew it, the way a lot of people do. For Roosevelt, though, the lesson was that a commitment to physical fitness could take a scrawny, unhealthy little boy and turn him into a vigorous young man. Now, as Roosevelt was coming to believe this, he was also becoming a fan of football, as were so many other Americans. Roosevelt remained a fan as he graduated from Harvard, entered politics, ranched out west, and became an increasingly visible public figure. In 1895, shortly before he became president of the New York City Police Commission, he wrote a letter to Walter Camp. And it's a great letter, and I'd like to read about 300 words from it. I am very glad, by the way, Roosevelt had a, had a kind of a high-pitched tinny voice. I've never heard a, I've never heard a recording of it. I, I don't know if, the, if there is one to hear, but we think of him as this big, you know, bulky president, maybe with a deep voice like this. No, he had kind of a high-pitched tinny voice. I think of him like, um, remember Don Adams on Guess, Get Smart? Kind of like that. That's how I think of him. I said this to my students the other day. Remember Don Adams on Get Smart? And got a bunch of blank stares on that one. And what's even worse is, is, is the, the, the TV show uh, Cheers came up in class the other day. Um, I had a class, I don't know, there were like 10 kids in the room and one of them had even heard of Cheers. Uh, anyway, um, here's, here's Roosevelt's letter. I am very glad to have a chance of expressing to you the obligation which I feel all Americans are under to you for your championship of athletics. The man on the farm and in the workshop here, as in other countries, is apt to get enough physical work. But we were tending steadily in America to produce sedentary classes. And from this, the athletic spirit has saved us. Of all games, I personally like football the best. And I'd rather see my boys play it than see them play any other. I have no patience with the people who declaim against it because it necessitates rough play and occasional injuries. The rough play, if confined within manly and honorable limits, is an advantage. It is a good thing to have the personal contact about which the New York Evening Post snarls so much, and no fellow is worth his salt if he minds an occasional bruise or cut. Being nearsighted, I was not able to play football in college, and I never cared for rowing or baseball, so that I did all my work in boxing and wrestling. They are both good exercises, but they are not up to football. I am utterly disgusted with the attitude of President Elliott and the Harvard faculty about football. I do not give a snap for a good man who can't fight and hold his own in the world. A citizen has got to be decent, of course. That is the first requisite. But the second, and just as important, is that he shall be efficient, and he can't be efficient unless he is manly. Nothing has impressed me more in meeting college graduates during the 15 years I have been out of college than the fact that on average, the men who have counted most have been those who had sound bodies. Doesn't that just sound like Roosevelt? That's like totally a letter he'd write. So Roosevelt saw football as more than a diversion. He saw it as a positive social good, the kind of thing that would turn boys into men. So he's recruiting the Rough Riders three years later. 1898. You guys probably know the story, the popular story, right? He's, uh, he's Assistant Secretary of the Navy in Washington, D.C. Remember that? Remember that book about the Naval War of 1812 he wrote? Helped him get this job. He's, he's Assistant Secretary of the Navy in 1898. Uh, the Maine blows up in Havana Harbor. America's going to war. Roosevelt is desperate to fight. So he, he quits his job in Washington, makes it possible to, to, to lead Lead a, bar, lead a group of men, a regiment of men, or be, be involved in leadership, I should say, because he, he was actually the number two guy with this regiment. Um, and he goes out to San Antonio to recruit the Rough Riders, right? And you know the legend. He wants cowboys and ranchers. You know, he wants the men of the West. These are who the Rough Riders were. And that's all true. That's basically what happened. But if you read his memoir about this period, it's called the Rough Riders. You read his memoir about that year, he says one other thing. He's not just looking for cowboys and ranchers. He's also looking for football players. And he signs up a bunch. He thought that football gave them the stuff it would take to win a war in Cuba. 
Now, the Duke of Wellington reportedly once said that the Battle of Waterloo was won on the playing fields of Eton. Roosevelt never said anything quite as pithy about football or the Battle of San Juan Hill. But when he emerged from the Spanish-American War as a national hero, a national hero who was talked about as possibly presidential timber, he knew how much he owed not just to the Rough Riders, but to the culture of manliness and risk-taking that had shaped them. Now, like Roosevelt, our society values sports today, though we don't always think about why or why we should. Now, I, my own kids have played every sport you can imagine, uh, you know, baseball, basketball, football, hockey, lacrosse, um, soccer. My daughter's a jock. <clears throat> As a family, we're, we're fairly sports-oriented. It has forced me to think about a question that a lot of parents ask themselves as you're you know, driving kids around in the minivan from practice to game to practice to game and all that. Um, why do we want our kids to participate in athletics? Why is this important to us? And when parents talk about this thing, you know, you know, why, why this? Why not let them play more video games at home or, or spend more time you know, learning to read ancient Greek or whatever? Why, why sports? Why do we value sports? When parents talk about this, you know, certainly what I've asked them what the motivations are, you, you, you can probably guess what you hear. A lot of talk about you know, health and fitness is good exercise, it's good for them. When you dig a little bit deeper, you hear things like sports teach things you can't learn in the classroom about about uh, 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 building character or about teamwork. You can learn lessons through sports that are important. It turns out that there really is something to all this. Empirical research shows that kids who play sports stay in school longer. As adults, they're more likely to vote and they make more money. If you play sports in high school, the average, the average person plays sports in high school will make 15% more income over his life than a person doesn't play, that doesn't play sports in high school. Explaining why this is true is trickier, but it probably has something to do with developing a competitive instinct and a desire for achievement. Roosevelt was probably correct in believing that sports influence the character of a nation. Americans are much more likely than Europeans to play sports. We're also much more likely to attribute economic success to hard work as opposed to luck. It may be that sports are a manifestation or possibly even a source of American exceptionalism, something that makes America different from every other country. In 1899, Roosevelt delivered what may be the most famous speech he ever gave, called The Strenuous Life. Soon after, he rewrote it for kids. A, a children's version of The Strenuous Life appeared in a children's magazine. The new version described how a boy can, quote, grow into the kind of American man of whom America can be really proud. For Roosevelt, this meant playing sports. The great growth in the love of athletic sports, he wrote, has had an excellent effect in increased manliness. He singled out the rough sports for their development of pluck, endurance, and physical fitness. And he concluded with a direct reference to what many regarded as the roughest sport of all. In short, in life, as in a football game, the principle is hit the line hard, don't foul and don't shirk, but hit the line hard. An exclamation point at the end. Soon enough, Roosevelt became one of the hardest hitting chief executives ever to live in the White House. His overall political legacy is mixed, but he was unfailingly colorful. Now, as Roosevelt presided in Washington, football remained controversial, and Harvard's Eliot continued his crusade for prohibition. In 1905, Roosevelt was persuaded to act. He invited to the White House Walter Camp of Yale, coach of Yale, and also the coaches from Harvard and Princeton. These were the three biggest football programs of the time, Harvard, Yale, Princeton. A lot has changed since then, obviously. Uh, but those were the big three, and there, there was no professional football. That, comes, that starts to come in the 1920s. So the coaches from the three biggest programs. They met in the White House in October. Football is on trial, said Roosevelt, because I believe in the game. I want to do all I can to save it. He encouraged the coaches to eliminate brutality. He pro they, and, they, and they promised that they would. Whether they actually meant it is another matter. Walter Camp didn't see anything wrong with football in 1905. 
He, in fact, thought he'd gotten the rules just about right in 1905. He didn't really see a name. To, he didn't really see a need to change it. He was satisfied with the game, with the way the game was played. Harvard's coach, however, was a young man named Bill Reed. He took Roosevelt more seriously. And as a Harvard man, he understood the, the, the threat to football differently from these other coaches because he was around Charles Elliott all the time. He knew that Elliott wanted to eliminate the game, and within weeks of this meeting at the White House with Roosevelt. He became convinced that Elliot was on the verge of success at Harvard. That Elliot was just about he was, he was just about to win this struggle and have football drop the sport. Now, if Harvard drops football, a lot of other colleges are going to drop football, just because Harvard is a leader. Other schools look to it; they want to be like Harvard. They do what Harvard does. If Harvard drops football, a bunch of other schools are going to drop it, and the future of football is imperiled. <coughs> One of the jokes at the time, by the way, is that the reason, and you know, one of the jokes at the time is that the reason the reason why Harvard wanted to drop football is because they couldn't beat Yale. They, they, they went for like 20 years, 20 or 25 years, you know, starting with that game in 1876, where that Yale won the one nothing game. Um, over that period, Harvard won like twice. So Yale just, you know, and this was one of the reasons why Walter Camp is so great, you know beating, you know, win, 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 and against your rival year after year after year. Um, and this, this drove Roosevelt crazy as a Harvard man. You know, he really wanted to beat Yale, and, and, and they, were, they just weren't able to. But this was the joke. You know, Harvard wants to drop football because they can't beat Yale. Anyway, Bill Reed sees this threat. He perceives this threat on his own campus and, and, and decides he has to do something about it. So at the end of the 1905 season, Reed plotted with a group of reform-minded colleges to form an organization that today we know of as the NCAA. They approved a set of sweeping rule changes to reduce football's violence. And in committee meetings, Reed outmaneuvered camp and received critical behind-the-scenes support from Roosevelt. That offseason, football experienced its extreme makeover. The yardage necessary for a first down increased from 5 to 10. The rule makers also created a neutral zone at the line of scrimmage, limited the number of players who could line up in the backfield, made the personal foul a heavily penalized infraction, and banned the tossing of ball carriers. Now you laugh, but they would want a, a common play when you just were going to pick up two or three yards. Was, was just to, to grab the guy with the ball and throw him across the line, right? And remember, these are big dudes and they're not wearing helmets or anything. There's even a story about a player who took the, the handles from suitcases and stitched them to the sides of his jersey so his teammates could get a better grip when they threw him. Well, after 1905, this became illegal. You weren't allowed to do that anymore. And these were all important revisions, but the one that would transform the sport, that would make it forever different, that would turn this rugby-like game into the American football we know today was the advent of the forward pass. Because up until this time, there were quarterbacks, but there were no wide receivers. There was no passing game in football. For years, a number of football men had wanted to introduce the forward pass. They thought, this is an exciting play. We should, uh, we should adopt it. Uh, one of them was a, was a coach named, named John Heisman. Name may ring a bell, right? Uh, but Camp, Walter Camp, in, in, in the rules committee he controlled, always blocked them, always said no to the forward pass. Bill Reed's committee, though, when he set up this rival committee that wound about maneuvering Camp, decided to permit the forward pass in order to open up the game, spread it across the field. Rather than big masses of large men in the middle, they'd be spread across the field, uh, speed would start to play a greater role, and so on. It took them a few years to get the rule right. Uh, when the first, the first, the first uh, um, uh, coaches and, and teams didn't always know how to take advantage of the latest revisions, and, and the football had to change shape. Remember, it was still shaped like a watermelon. Okay, so they had, they had to turn into the football we know today, the more aerodynamic thing. That, that took a few years also. The first, uh, the first year they, had, they, they allowed passing, 
it was rarely used in 1906 because it was so it was such a risky play. If you threw an incompletion, it was a turnover. So teams were reluctant to throw the ball. Uh, you know, it's, it's like if you threw it, if your if your guy didn't catch it, it was basically throwing an interception. So they so they didn't use it so much, um, uh, and and it took them it took them a few years to to get the rules just right. But after 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 a few years, everything clicked, everything worked. And on November 1st, 1913, football moved irreversibly in the mod, into the modern era. Army was one of the best teams in the country, a national championship contender that year. It was scheduled to play a game against a little-known Catholic school from the Midwest. Army wants big score, read the headline in the New York Times that morning. It was going to be a blowout. You know, just like when Michigan played Appalachian State. You can probably guess the rest of the story. This little known Catholic school from the Midwest that nobody had ever heard of before was Notre Dame. Knut Rockne and his teammates launched football's first true air war, throwing again and again and again for receptions and touchdowns. They beat Army that day, 35 to 14. The Westerners flashed the most sensational football that has been seen in the East this year, gushed the New York Times. The Army players were hopelessly confused and chagrined before Notre Dame's great playing, and their style of old-fashioned, close, line-smashing play was no match for the spectacular and highly perfected attack of the Indiana Collegians. A cadet named Dwight Eisenhower watched from the sidelines. He was on Army's football team, but he was injured that day. He couldn't play, so he just watched. Everything has gone wrong, he wrote to his girlfriend. The football team got beaten most gloriously by Notre Dame. And with that game, football's long first chapter came to a close, and the game we know today was born. Violence in football didn't end, but the sport solved its problem and improved his quality at the same time. Nobody speaks of prohibiting football anymore. When many influential people did, however, Theodore Roosevelt stepped in and played an unheralded but critical role in the sports development. Now, as a general rule, I don't think we want our politicians messing with our sports, right? The, the only thing that could make the BCS system worse is congressional involvement. And I'm not making this, there have been hearings on the Hill about the BCS system. But the example of Roosevelt does show that a skillful leader with a light touch can solve a vexing problem. Decades after Roosevelt's involvement in football, after he was long gone, Bill Reed, the Harvard coach, who lost his job because even he couldn't beat Yale, Bill Reed, the Harvard coach, hailed Roosevelt's role. Except for this chain of events, there might now be no such thing as American football as we know it, he wrote. You ask me whether President Theodore Roosevelt helped save the game, I can tell you that he did. So Theodore Roosevelt took on many roles in American life. He was a war hero, a trust buster, a canal builder, a big stick wielding diplomat. But one of the most important roles he played was as football's indispensable fan. Thank you very much. I want to uh... First of all, thank you for such an engaging talk and uh, one that helps me defend my football habit uh, in the Saturday afternoons and uh, going to the big house myself. Um, I don't ever want these talks to get too far away from the, the founding benefactor of the Hallenstein Center, Ralph Hallenstein, who's going to be 100 years old in uh, less than 30 days now. And, uh, Ralph and I are in daily contact, uh, as is uh, his family, is here in the front row. And um, I've got a little football story for you. You probably have heard this many times, Ralph. But um, Ralph was at Central High School. He played football. And um, he always used to go up against a team from South High School that had a player a little bit bigger than he was, a little bit younger than he was, but who flattened him every time they played. And that player was Gerald R. Ford. <laughs> So Ralph, Ralph was introduced to the future president of the United States quite early in his, his own career.